Blessed Jagger's daughter was a third order Franciscan. He's a farmer who worked also as a sacristan at the local parish church. He was deferred from military service several times, but in 1940, at the age of 33, he was conscripted into the German army. After completing basic training, he returned home in 1941 as an an exemption for a farmer. But two years later, he was called to active service. And by then, he became convinced that these wars against Poland, against Czechoslovakia, against France, these wars that Germany was waging as an aggressor were unjust. He said, God has given me a gift of seeing things as they are. He offered to serve as a paramedic, but he was refused. Instead, they wanted him to fight as a, a, a frontline front soldier. Many of his fellow Catholics tried to persuade him to abandon his position, attempting to show how many Catholics were going along with the flow. His answer, quote, Again and again they tried to trouble my conscience over my wife and children. Is it an action any better because one is married and has children? Is it better or worse because thousands of other Catholics are doing the same? Everyone tells me, of course, that I should not do what I am doing because of the danger of death. I believe it's better to sacrifice one's life right away than to place oneself in a grave danger of committing sin and then dying. He later described a dream that he had, and this he had in 1938, a dream that he describes in his own words. Quote, I want to begin by describing a short experience that I underwent on the January, January 9th of 1938. I initially lay awake in bed until midnight, even though I was not sick. Then I must have fallen asleep for at least a little while, for I saw in a dream a wonderful train as it came around a mountain. With little regard for the adults, children flowed to this train and were not held back. There were present a few adults who did not go in, into the area, I do not want to give their names nor describe them. Then a voice said to me, This train is going to hell. He realized this train was none other than the Nazi party. For his convictions for opposing the immoral demands of that current regime, he was executed 9 August 1943 at the age of 36. This train is going to hell. He knew very well where the Nazi party was leading. It was very sobering. But it is something that we should think about on this uh, 13th day of October. We should consider what Our Lady of Fatima says specifically concerning wars. In fact, Sister Saint, uh, excuse me, uh, Blessed Jacinta, one of the seers also of Fatima, um, had a little vision of her own. Sister Lucia Santos explains it. She says, Going to Jacinta's house one day for a short visit, I found her sitting on the bed in a pensive mode. What are you thinking about, Jacinta? Of the war that is coming. So many will die and almost all of them will go to hell. Many homes will be destroyed and many priests will be killed. Those are very sobering words as well. Our Lady, after showing the vision of hell, turned to her children, turned to the three children and said, You have seen hell, where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to the Immaculate Heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. The war is going to end, but if people do not cease offending God, a worse war will break out. She later would say, wars are nothing but punishments for the sins of the world. Wars are punishments for the sins of the world. So we can ask if wars are punishments for the sins of the world. One might ask, is it moral? Is it moral to enter in to a war? Is it moral, is it moral to fight? Well, let us consider this then. Let us consider this question. First of all, the first point we should consider is 
that the desire to serve a country, the desire to defend it, is in and of itself good. It comes from the virtue of piety, virtue of justice. Consider, for example, exa- the, those examples we have before us in the Holy Scripture. Our Lord praised the centurion for his faith. We also see that in Luke 3, chapter 14, soldiers came up to him to, wanting to know how they were to advance in holiness. And our Lord said, or this is the words of the, the, the gospel, those soldiers also asked him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said to them, Do violence to no man, neither calumniate any man, and be content with your pay. Our Lord reminded them that they will be judged for the violence they inflict, as well as the morality of their lives. Remember also in Holy Scripture that the centurion, Cornelius, he was the first Gentile to convert at the hand of St. Peter. So in these examples, we see the esteem that the very Word of God holds for those who are in the military. Even the Catechism of the Catholic Church of 1994 says, if they carry out their duty honorably, they truly contribute to the good of the nation and maintenance of peace. So that's the first point that we consider, is entering into the military is intrinsically good. The second thing we we consider in in this day and age, in this country, we consider this thing, the very fact that entering into the military in this day and age, in this time, in this country, is voluntary. It's voluntary. One is not obliged to enter in. One is not compelled to join. And then the third point we can consider is, and we present this in the form of a question, the way things are right now in this country, in the military, how easy will it be for me to save my soul if I were to enter in? The question here concerns a means. We see the end. The end is getting to heaven. That's everybody's end, is to get to heaven. And we ask the question, is this, what I have before me, going to help me to get to heaven or not? We can rephrase the question by saying, would I be prudent in choosing this means, the military career, right now, for the end that I have in mind, heaven? It's a question of prudence. It's a question about means to an end. And for this, we should do a real quick review of what prudence is. Prudence is a virtue. It's It's about something practical of what we are to do. It is a virtue, a power in our soul. And so there are eight things that are attached to that virtue of prudence. First of all, memory. Thinking about past events. Thinking about past events is one of them. The next is understanding the events as they are. So that's memory and understanding are two parts of prudence. Then docility, the ability to be advised by somebody. It's a part of prudence. Shrewdness, the, be, the, the, the ability to be able to, to take in the, that information in a, in a shrewd manner. And then reasoning, that, that is uh, being able to go from A to B and thinking about the things that are laid before us and coming to the proper conclusions. And then finally, there is the caution and circumspection, which we also should have. All these eight parts, memory, understanding, Docility, shrewdness, reason, caution and circumspection are part of prudence. And so we have to have these if we are to be a prudent person. So let us ask three questions then about entering into the military. If one was to enter into the military, would they be fighting just wars? That is the question that we can ask. Because the justness of a war is essential for us to being moral in the military. A second question is, if one was to go to war would they, or join the military, would they be able to preserve their souls from habitual sin? Are they given the means to keep themselves from habitual sin? That's the second question. And then the third question, are, am I going to be asked to compromise my faith? Those three questions we can ask ourselves so that we can determine whether it's prudent if we enter into the military. What are the chances of ending up in a just, an unjust war? That's the first question. When Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger was asked 
If the second Iraq war was just, he replied, quote, All I can do is invite you to read the catechism, and the solution seems obvious to me. In the catechism of the Catholic Church, there are four, four conditions making a, a, a war just or not. And these we consider. The first one, the first condition of whether a war is just or not is the damage inflicted by the aggressor on the nation or community of nations must be lasting, grave, and certain. So the aggressor, the one who's attacking, the one that we are defending against, the damage inflicted by that aggressor must be lasting, grave, and certain. Okay. So it can't be something that we suspect. We simply suspect things. Or we're, we're basing it on slim evidence. That is not certain. It can't be, well, he might attack us one day. It has to be lasting and grave. Notice that this condition for a just war rules out preemptive war and also makes regime change, war for regime change, totally immoral. These are ruled out by this one condition for a just war. Now, there are some who love Pope John Paul II so much on all these issues, but on this one thing, they had a problem with him. When he spoke out against an unjust war, they simply said, well, that's his opinion. Up until this point, everything that he says, we have to follow. But then in this one thing, they took that and said, well, that's his opinion, and they put it on the shelf. They put it away. We're not going to hear him on this issue. Well, consider well that the Holy Father, when judging on things on the natural law, in which this is a question of whether this is a just war or not, he is the court of last appeals. And to say that, well, that's just his opinion, that's something very rash. And to them we quote Pope Leo XIII, who wrote in Sapientia Christiani, about the conflict between these two duties. He says, quote, The order of precedence of these duties is, however, at times either under stress of public calamities or through the perverse will of men inverted. For instances occur when the state seems to require men as subjects one thing and religion from men as Christians quite another. And this in reality without any other ground than that the rulers of the state either hold the sacred power of the church of no account or endeavor to subject it to their own will. Hence arises a conflict and an occasion through such conflict of virtue being put to, to the proof. He goes on to say that as to which should be preferred, no one ought to give, no one ought to balance for an instant. It is a high crime indeed to withdraw allegiance from God in order to please men, an act of consummate wickedness to break the laws of Jesus Christ in order to yield obedience to earthly rulers or under pretext of keeping the civil law to ignore the rights of the church. We ought to obey God rather than men. So the second question we can ask then about whether I can go in or not or should go in or not is, all, oh, excuse me, all, the second condition for that just war is, have all other means been put to an end? Have we exhausted all other means? Then the third is, there must be a serious prospect of success. To simply enter into a war with no end in sight would make that unjust. A war on a very vague war on terror with no prospect of success. That is another condition. A fourth condition then for the just war is the use of arms must not produce evils and disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. The use of arms must not produce evils or disorders graver than the evil to be eliminated. Before the invasion of Iraq, 800,000 Catholics lived in Iraq. Eight years later, 150,000 Catholics were left. And the Mohammedans that, that persecuted the rest that remained there 
while those who were in charge, those who could have done something about it, defending the innocent, allowed the Mahabhanans to persecute those Christians. And in fact, you see the same pattern in other countries that we've gotten involved in. Libya, Syria. Each of these cases we see have ended up, we've ended up backing up Al-Qaeda. If the answer was obvious, then for Cardinal Ratzinger, if this was a just war, it should be very clear for us when we're presenting with those four criteria of a just war. Note also that if somebody was involved in an unjust war, which was immoral, those actions that are involved in continuing that just war are also immoral. St. Alphonsus says this, quote, If a soldier knows that a war is unjust in which he is involved, one cannot absolve him unless he first wills to arrange to relieve, be relieved of duty and in the meantime abstains from hostile acts. So if a soldier knows that a war is unjust in which he is involved, one cannot absolve him. He's talking to priests. Unless he first wills to arrange to be relieved of duty and in the meantime abstains from hostile acts. I know of many men in the military, many men who have put their career online for lesser things, for cases of, of safety, for cases of people breaking certain uh, laws, people uh, that, that they were willing, these commanders were willing to put their career on the line for this. A comparison can be made with the home invasion. A man comes and invades a home, and he holds the people down, he ties them down, he holds guns over them, unjustly. Now, if one were to continue in this, the injustice continues. The only answer for him is to leave that house. And one could not continue to supply this man with ammunition or to support him in this, because this is unjust. Now, we, after looking at those four conditions of, of just or unjust, we also ask the second question. Are men who go to war or join the military able to preserve their souls from habitual sin? If I'm making a prudent decision of whether I want to go in and I want to save my soul, because that's the end, am I going to be able to do this? Are they given, are the soldiers, are those who go in given the means to keep themselves from habitual sin. Well, consider this headline. Obama administration denies mass to Catholics. The story. Father Ray Leonard, who serves at the National Submarine, Naval Submarine Base in Kings Bay, Georgia, wasn't allowed to celebrate mass this past weekend. The chapel doors were locked and the sign said, shut down, no Catholic service till further notice. Father Leonard said the following. This is our church. Catholics have an expectation and obligation to attend Mass, and they were told, no, you can't go to church this weekend. My parishioners couldn't believe that in America they'd been denied access to, gov- to Mass by the government. Even though priests were willing to volunteer to say Mass free of charge, they wouldn't be paid for anything, yet they were still denied the use of the facilities, and they were also told that they would be facing charges if they did, or they would be released from their service. Consider this also as well, morally speaking. There was a certain lieutenant that went to Thailand, and for anyone who knows, anyone who's been in the military knows what Thailand means. It's a very corrupt Very immoral place. It's like Rio de Janeiro, some other immoral place. And he was down there for the the good part of Lent, for all of Lent. He was down there. And he didn't see one priest, one priest at all. There was another, an 82nd Airborne soldier, doing cave sweeps in Afghanistan for eight and a half months. And again, he returned for 16 months. And you know how many opportunities he had when he was out there? Zero. He didn't see a chaplain once. We know how hard it is to try to keep our souls clean. Huh? 
in uh, in the situation we're in, and we have access to the sacraments all the time. But out there, they have also internet access. Yet they don't have access to a chaplain. Here we have a man who's at the very tip of the spear, risking his life, his life in danger of being taken, and no chaplain. If anyone has been in the military, they know how much of a battle it is. Sins against the Sixth and Ninth Commandment everywhere. Drinking, blasphemy. How difficult it is to keep above all that. So Catholics are to have their faith persecuted, and at the same time, they don't have access to the sacraments. Then a third question we can ask is, will I be asked to compromise my faith if I enter in? Is that possible? San Antonio, Texas, Lackland Air Force Base. Senior Master Sergeant Philip Monk, a 19-year-old veteran, was punished after he refused to tell his female commander, who herself was a practitioner of unnatural vice, his position on San Francisco-style marriages for his his suspected unfriendliness towards the agenda of this unnatural vice, Monk was set up for a court-martial. Nineteen years in, he's coming up on retirement. The vendetta that comes from this, huh? One airman was told that even thinking that this unnatural vice is a sin, is discriminatory, even thinking it. There was a colonel in the Air Force who told his pastor that the officers are being ordered to publicly affirm and promote the unnatural perversion. An officer, he was a lieutenant, in the room of a bunch of other superior officers, was going through politically indoctrination classes, and numerous scenarios were presented to them, and they were expected to respond. The last scenario was this, that a female, because of her alternate lifestyle, came back from a service and was disturbed by what the why the chaplain had said to her. And what are you supposed to do as a commanding officer? The answer was, you're supposed to report him. You're supposed to report him. This young officer stood up and said, wait a minute, this is something right out of Nazi Germany. And everybody was quiet, and they concluded that session. But none of the other senior officers said anything. He was a young lieutenant. And at the end, some of them came up and patted him on the back. But they were worried about their careers. They were worried about their careers. And so that's what you would have to face in coming in. So we go down back over the virtue of prudence. And we ask the question, and we go over reason and memory. Can I reasonably conclude that I might be thrust into an unjust war? Anytime soon, considering our past record. Caution and circumspection we use. Could I be play, could I be placing my soul in risk of falling into serious sin without any means of getting me out of it? Are, are the sacraments going to be available to me? And is the condition into which I'm entering going to be very moral? Understanding. Do I understand that under the current regime, I won't be permitted to hold on to the moral teachings of my faith openly, but I will be expected to support unnatural vices and docility? Am I docile to the counsel of others? Now, somebody may ask, well, Father, I know of of other saints who have served under difficult regimes, St. Sebastian, St. Morris, St. George. St. Sebastian, we have to remember, when he entered in, he wasn't desiring to enter in. He was given a special movement of grace, and he went in specifically to go to Rome to encourage those who were already being persecuted. So it was a special inspiration of grace for him. St. George was already in the military when the persecution began. And St. Morris, who died with 6,600 other Catholics, was fighting a just war against an insurrection on the fringes of the empire. They were paying to Caesar what was Caesar's and rendering to God what was God's. 
What about those who are serving now, we might ask as well? Well, they have a great cross to bear, and we have to pray for them. We have to pray for them. Because all around them, they're being pulled down, and so we have to pray for them. And often, often all the, those who are over them are not going to support them. You're not going to get the support of so many of the offers, officers in higher places. Pope Leo XIII, speaking of, uh, in Sapiencia Christiani, also speaks about the courage that is expected. Some there are indeed who maintain that it is not opportune boldly to attack evil doing in its might and when it is in assent, lest, as they say, opposition should ex- exasperate the minds already hostile. These make it a matter of guesswork as to whether they are for the church or against her, since on the one hand they give themselves out as professing the Catholic faith and yet wish that the church should allow certain opinions at variance with her teachings to be spread abroad with impunity. He says, The enemies of the church have for their object, and they hesitate not to proclaim it, and and many among them boast of it to destroy outright, if possible, Catholic religion, which is alone the true religion. With such a purpose in hand, they shrink from nothing, for they are fully conscious that the more faint-hearted those who withstand them become, the more easily will it be to work out their wicked will. Therefore, they who cherish the prudence of the flesh and who pretend to be unwary of that every Catholic ought to be a valiant soldier of Christ, they would fain obtain the rewards owing to conquerors while they are leading lives of cowards, untouching in the fight, are so few from thwarting the onward march of the evil disposed that on contrary, they help it forward. They have many things, we have many things to pray for here. But we consider and we close with the words of blessed Jaggerstadter. He wrote in prison these words. If I must write with my hands in chains, I find that much better than if my will were in chains. Neither prison nor chains nor sentence of death can rob a man of the faith and his free will. God gives so much strength that it is possible for, for him to bear any suffering. People worry about the obligations of conscience as they concern my wife and children. But I cannot believe that just because one has a wife and children, a man is free to offend God. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us.